Morning, Ian. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. Good. Fire away. Okie dokie. Uh, so the um, uh, the new album, Rock Flute, to give it its uh, English pronunciation, is out this Friday, the 21st, I believe. There will be a, a purchasing link just below this video, uh, and I would urge you to check it out. Uh, if I may, Ian, I'd like to ask two or three questions about the new album. Fire away, yeah. The first question is a rather obvious one, though, is uh, what's inspired you to base an album on Norse legends? <clears throat> Uh, that it was a tricky topic because of its association with um, the fantasy merchants who extol the virtues of Vikings and um, Nordic, uh, rather triumphant sort of comic book stuff. I mean, heavy metal bands in Scandinavia do that kind of thing. And, of course, there's the, the historic fascination of Nordic culture that comes um, along with Tolkien, Wagner, and very worryingly with uh, Heinrich Himmler mm -hmm. and his pals in that um, in that uh, bad period of history. So it's a tricky subject and one that initially I discarded in the first hour or two of thinking about the structure of a new album, and then. I thought, well, why be scared off? You know, maybe that's the responsibility of a a writer to, um, you know, find a way to deal with the subject and do it with a little bit more finesse, a little bit, a um, little bit more sensitivity. So that's what I set out to do, and um, I have no affiliation whatsoever with any pagan groups or, um, you know, or those who extol the comic book hero virtue of the. The Vikings, who were a pretty evil bunch. Um, I mean, you know, they were colonists, and um, yeah. all colonists have, unfortunately, a, a history of doing some bad stuff, and um, you know, the British Empire included. But you know, we try and get over that and see the error of our ways. Yeah, it's um, uh, what interested me actually. I believe this album is going to be. I read some that it was going to be an instrumental album. I'm intrigued to understand why and at what point did you feel this concept was better served by an album of songs and poetry rather than just music? It was never really intended to be an instrumental album. It was uh, intended to be an album that would be heavy on flute, hence its initial working title before I started work. That is, you know, in the, towards the end of, nine, uh, of 2021, I was simply... Um, you know, I, I just simply had the title at the top of my empty page, you know, document file saying rock flute. <laughs> but that's once I got into the subject matter that I decided on, um, I decided to legitimize um, the use of the umlaut in the word rock, which is an old Icelandic word meaning destiny. Um, and Flöte, which is the German spelling and pronunciation of the the flute, the instrument I play. So it, it it's just slightly changed in, in a playful way. Uh -huh. um, this album actually follows rather hard upon the the, the zealot gene. Um, I'm just interested to know whether or not you had anything. Was was there anything left over from that album that you kind of reworked for this one, or was this album from ground zero, so to speak? Uh, it was a completely fresh start. The Zealot Gene was written, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I started it in the beginning of 2017. Um, and we recorded seven tracks, but due to pressure of touring, I think at the time I only finished four of them. And then the pressure of touring and then COVID came along. So there was a long gap between the initial writing of the album and the, the final release. But... Um, in terms of the new album, then no, nothing, nothing was left over. The Zealot Gene was twelve songs, uh, specifically written, and there were no additional, um, no additional material. I, I might have written some lyrics to another song that I didn't record, but um, no, not, not, nothing. That the um, Rock Flirter was a, a completely fresh start. So I, I, um, I, I don't really like reusing material in that way, you know, mm -hmm. songs left over from, it just doesn't sit well with me to do that. 
I I I like to press delete in <laughs> in my in my brain before I start anything else. Yeah. Okay. Uh, interesting. Hammer on hammer was evoking of the Thor myth. I mean, would you describe this number as a wider meditation on war, especially with the references to Vlad the Bad? Hmm. Exactly that. Yeah. But um, you know, it's um, it's it's uh, it seems in in historical terms, it is not uncommon for small men to want to um, somehow make up for their diminutive size by um becoming rather aggressive and warlike mm -hmm. it's a small people are not all like that <laughs> but napoleon and vlad the bad for sure are and um um it's it's a topic too good to resist when you have a little bit of personal anecdotal stuff to slip into the lyrics like meeting Anatoly Sobchak, the, the mayor of St. Petersburg, back in uh, 1992, when Putin, who was also there in the after-show after meet and greet, was um, was at that time his chief advisor, um, but also a serving part-time major in the KGB. So, uh, you know, the, the, the personal touch is important to me in the last two, last two stanzas of each of the songs... Uh, I, I I like to, you know, kind of look at a parallel in my own life, something that I can relate to in a personal way about the personalities and characters involved mm -hmm. in in the uh, in the the myths of Norse religion. So um, it's, it's a suitable, fertile ground for writing, really, but maybe it's on a I hope it's on a different plane to that of simply talking all the time in in uh, grandiose terms about Viking long ships and raping and plundering and looting. I only make uh, a minimal reference to that in one song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, quite a silly question, actually, next. is uh, This album comes out a week after the new Metallica album. Should they be worried? Well, I don't think so for a minute. No, Metallica have had a long gap without an album, as far as I understand, and um, I have nothing to do with Met Well, actually, I do have something to do with Metallica. The guitar player um, got in touch with my son just saying how much he was enjoying listening to classic Jethro Tull music mm -hmm. now, as opposed to back then. And um, so uh, the connection with Metallica, obviously, is, is through the... The um, Grammy, the, the Grammy Award mess up really with the um, creation of a new category, which was meant the it was awarded to us in a an un, unlikely and probably not very clever way. But um, Metallica took it in good spirits, and as I said at the time, you know, don't worry, guys, you'll win the Grammy next year, <laughs> and they did. I was interested. I was reading the um, liner notes or notes that uh, accompany the 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 I think 50th anniversary of Stand Up, and uh, Clive Bunker says Davio List uh, is too quirky for Jethro Tull. To what extent would you agree with him? Well, David Ellis was a an odd guitar player when he played with the Nice. Mm -hmm. That was what made him interesting. He he wasn't a blues guitarist, or at least if he was, he wasn't a very good one. But what what he did was come up with with appropriate and good ideas that were not just as a direct result of having learned a few B.B. King solos. It, it, so he, he seemed like an interesting guy, but it became quite apparent when we got together and messed around with some ideas that, you know, he wanted to play a part in writing the songs right from the very beginning. And I, I'm not a collaborator. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, either I write the songs or you write the songs, but I, I can't. I can't collaborate. I find it embarrassing to go through that creative process together. So um, it was never going to work out, and I don't think his guitar playing would have been a natural evolution from Mick Abrahams to whatever came next. It would have been too big a jump. Whereas Martin Barr, on the other hand could play the blues a bit and he could also come up with new ideas that didn't owe anything to 
the traditional Chicago blues guitarists, or indeed the the, the British imitators, who um, some of whom were very very good, like Peter Green, who I always regarded as the top of the tree in terms of of having the ability to be selective and to understand the value of silence, to understand the value of note placement, without necessarily playing endless flurries of fast notes to show how clever you are or were. So, I mean, Peter Green at that time, I think he was he was the best of the bunch. I mean, I rated him more more so than Eric Clapton just because Peter Green had a, a beautiful and thoughtful tonal quality to his playing and his phrasing was, you know, very precise and felt very natural. Mm. So... Um, Peter Peter was the was was the best of the guys I thought, and in the same way he wouldn't have been the right guitar player for Jethro Tull because he was too steeped in the blues, and and the early Fleetwood Mac's attempts to move away a little bit with slightly more adventurous music, um, like uh, the Rattlesnake Shake or the Maharishi, uh, the Green Mah or something or other with a tail whatever it was Manorit, Ma, 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 I can't remember the name of the title Manorit, but these, 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 these things were more of a you know more of a move to what became progressive rock mm -hmm. but Peter I think would have been constrained by the um, mentality of the other musicians he was working with and I don't think they ever could have got very far in that direction given the other members of the band and then of course Peter Green fell by the wayside in a, in a tragic way um, I think matched only by another inventive guitar player and, and lyricist um, um, who in the early days of Pink Floyd marked them out as being um, the next thing to the Beatles Sergeant Pepper in terms of having something really new to say, which was a, a signpost pointing towards progressive rock, which it was not yet called at that point in 1967, but a couple of years later it was. Mm -hmm. Did you ever so, see? I mean, so, yeah, Sid, Sid Barrett and uh, and Peter Green, both victims of uh, dodgy drugs, and whether they were bringing it upon themselves or just happened to get some particularly polluted or awful variety that um, got passed on to them, I have really no idea. I stay, in a way, those are examples that just kept me and I hope a lot of other people away from experimenting with drugs that it isn't always fun and games it sometimes has tragic circumstances and consequences which um just as uh, obviously severe use of alcohol does too mm -hmm. so there, there are object lessons for people like me stay clear of that stuff you know just just enjoy a glass of wine or a beer or whatever you do and, and know and learn how to place limits on yourself. Did you ever see uh, Pink Floyd with Sid Barrett? Hmm. We played together on a bill at the Flora Hall in Southport in 1967. And and um, it was a very unlikely gig for both of us because Flora Hall was really a, a bit of a punch-up venue for... Um, you know, folk, folks who... who wanted as they did in blackpool you know they, they, they just wanted rock and roll they, they weren't interested in anything clever or progressive and at that point the john evans band which we i think we still were i'm not sure yes we must have been um we were kind of jazz blues and pink floyd were psychedelic free prog mm -hmm. um and we 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 all met with stony deafness from the point of view of the audience just looking mesmerized before they sauntered out to the bar and um I, I attempted to talk to sid barrett because i knew pink floyd from you know a couple of singles they'd released and indeed from piper at the gates of dawn which we had just bought i think and i mean i, I wouldn't say they were particularly great live but there was some magic going on for sure and sid barrett could still hold a tune and do the job but clearly an attempt at a conversation just met with a bit of a glazed stare and sort of a mumbled rather incoherent response so he, he wasn't um he wasn't a terribly well boy at that point yeah. sadly okay interestingly you you list uh, roy harper and bert yanch as an influence uh, uh, at this time i'm just interested to know to what extent 
were you listening to Dylan and the band? Were they on your radar radar at all? Yeah, they briefly passed across it, but I, I was never really a Bob Dylan fan. I, I grew to like some of his early work a few years later, but um, Roy Harper and ben, Bert Jansch and some of the English new folkies, they were... Um, that was really 1968 that I started listening to contemporary British folk, which was the parallel, I suppose, to what was called the folk revival in the USA that was spearheaded by Joan Baez and Bob Dylan, amongst others, in, in the sense that it was songs about real stuff, not necessarily faithful reproductions of historical archival folk music. And that's what appealed to me about some of the, the British guys, which I felt more relevance towards in the sense that they were singing about a world I knew, whereas Bob Dylan was still, wanted us all to believe he was still hitchhiking through the Midwest of America in a kind of Jack Kerouac fantasy world of his own, which I don't think I quite believed even then. He didn't have a private jet to begin with, but he wasn't long in getting one. <laughs> Uh, interesting. I, um, there seems to be a lot of um, on social media and the mainstream media. There seems to be almost a kind of sometimes an anti-West, anti-British vibe. I'm just wondering if an album that celebrates the myth and lore of the British Isles would be well received today if you were to do it today. Uh, I, 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 I don't know how to answer that question, but even if I did, I would say, well, so what? That's not my my job to uh, self-censor in order to avoid upsetting anybody if I, um, you know, I try to be sensitive in what I write. And a few times I may have, in terms of today's politically correct um, cancel culture, mm -hmm. maybe I've overstepped the mark two or three times by the standards of today. But the argument, as it would be for Rudyard Kipling, is... Mm -hmm. That was then. This is now. And I, I made a point of reading um, one of Kipling's books, um, uh, the uh, um, Notes from a Hill Station, it was, I think it was a title, but whatever it was, it was about his, his period of time as a young man living and working in India. And the whole book is a series of little vignettes of, of local people. Mm -hmm. And I was well into halfway through the book and everything was just hunky dory you know his his he was so respectful and kind and thoughtful towards local characters and personalities of of indians that he had to live amongst and work with and then suddenly out of the blue came something that was an unpleasant reference and it it, it shocked me deeply to, to suddenly find, goodness me, you know, this is why Kipling has these days a bad name, because of these few occasions that where he says something that he, you know, is, is not appropriate. However, I think you have to weigh that up again in the context of that was then, and overwhelmingly his his view of Indian people seemed to be very respectful and very caring and 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 talking very much of the virtues of the culture and society that he was in. So I think you could aim, aim the same criticism in a much greater way, at uh, particularly at the Old Testament, um, for overstepping the mark not once or twice, but countless times in terms of deep unpleasantness towards women, towards children, towards humanity in general. And But no one would so far would dare to uh, to uh, cancel the Holy Bible, but it, it's it's not that far off. When I think children, you know, schools will be telling children that the, you know they're not allowed to read the Bible, mm -hmm. or it'll have to be rewritten in some totally pathetic. I mean, of course, the Bible has been re rewritten so many times in more accessible and easy sort of uh, tea and scones fashion, particularly for the Americans who who like plain language rather than the language of the um, King James Version. But, uh, you know, it's full of that sort of stuff. And and so I feel that we always have to think in terms of what is right at the times. And perhaps 100 years from now, people will look back on this particular period of time with amazement that, um, that uh, a teacher at a girls' school, an all-girls' school, it's <laughs> all this referred to as a girls' school, uh -huh. And uh, and she had the temerity to say good morning, girls. Yes. And 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 then a bunch of bullshit 
presumably first year six or fifth formers, you know, decided that they wanted to get at her and complain to the uh, the head teachers about her not taking into account that some of them might think that they are transgender. Um, well, if you if you think so, what the fuck are you doing at a girls' school in the first place? You know, <laughs> it's. I mean, of course, it is totally absurd and goes too far. But people with an entrenched view about political correctness and and um, the woke agenda, they just don't see clearly through the through the the mists of rage, and um, it's rather sad. But uh, you know, again, it's the product of today, and all you can do largely is go along with it. But I, I refuse to use pronouns that are grammatically in you know, incorrect. So if somebody wants to be referred to um, as, them. as they or them, I, I will refuse to do it, but I will replace it with their name, mm -hmm. whatever that name might be. Um, because I, I just really don't like the, uh, the idea of twisting the language to accommodate something that, um, as we know from some examples, people change their minds sometimes too late after surgery and um, sue the National Health for cutting their dick off, you know, which is <laughs> those sort of things are, seem on the face of it rather laughable. But, you know, they're tragic and they're awful that people will get themselves into a position where they decide to do something and then change their mind. I mean, someone who has um, who has surgery to to really change their their sex as opposed to gender, then I, I I have all the sympathy sympathy in the world for that if they are thinking mature adults. But I am deeply disturbed that the the idea that children are being encouraged to question this. You know, my my twelve year old grandson came back from uh, from a, a from school saying that they'd been taught there was something like thirty something genders. Yes, and and he was joking about it and laughing about it. Um, but the fact that the children, are, this is being openly um, brought to their attention is just encouraging them to, you know, pick and choose something for the day and change their mind tomorrow. And very often without their parents' knowledge, it would seem from what I've heard, and that would be rather tragic that children don't discuss this first with their children, uh, with their parents, but discuss it with perhaps school staff or other, other peer group within the within the classroom it's um it's all a bit messy so i would i write about that i don't think i would in this at this point but you know if i was born 50 years later perhaps i would think it was it was definitely worth a visit to talk about the woke agenda and all of the um the uh, degree to which it is bent out of shape Sometimes for political reasons, sometimes for reasons of, of plain obsession and misguided good intentions. But whatever it is, it's 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 not fertile ground for me to visit and songwrite in terms right now. Not I'm not afraid of being cancelled at the age of seventy five. Who gives a shit? <laughs> being cancelled, it's not going to bother me. <laughs> I think I was cancelled by Chris Welch of Melody Maker back in nineteen seventy three. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not something that that would bother me but it's um it uh, is is something that i think out of respect you know you just think well this is not the time to to write on that subject because there are yeah. people albeit maybe relatively few who genuinely have in whatever aspect of woke agenda they do have a reasonable gripe and a reasonable concern and and perhaps a reasonable degree of anger so i don't want to offend people uh, when their views are justified. Yeah, well, we certainly live in interesting times. Uh, in fact, there's a Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Mm. Yeah. Well, we, we certainly do. And uh, yes. getting in, even more interesting as um, as the months progress, if not because of only Putin, but the Chinese adventures in the, in the military sphere and uh, and the imminent rise of donald trump again i mean the, these are definitely interesting times um that's interesting you mentioned um roger kipling um thomas hardy wrote about this wrote about the ache of modernity or the ache of modernism about this conflict between the old way of doing things and technological advancement 
was that an anxiety that you explored on the Heavy Horses album? I think that, uh, well, yeah, I mean, in, in simple terms on that particular track, yes, I guess it was. But it, it was a pretty, it was a, it was a, it was an easy target, you know. I mean, I lived on a farm. Um, horses were not employed on our farm, but tractors, in ever increasingly bigger ones, uh, were part of day to day life. And, you, you know, if you're sitting on a tractor hauling corn, um, to the grain dryer, you know, your your mind is sort of necessarily going to tick back to the to what took place on that farm a hundred years before when working horses were all that there was. And um it's a a pretty easy, you know, as I say, it's an easy target if you're looking for something to write about because it uh, is very, very close to home in that regard. But I think the technology and traditions are more exaggerated these days when as a musician, as a producer and engineer and songwriter, you have to think much more in terms of very advanced technology in the contemporary digital recording and the the aspects of of particularly acoustic instruments, which in the case of the instrument I plays is uh, is quite a is quite an, an old instrument. I mean its origins go back arguably fifty thousand years, but in terms of the modern concert flute, it's um, you know 170, 180 years uh, of uh, it's been pretty much exactly the way that it is now. And acoustic guitars, you know, I, I don't have one sitting right here, but in the house I have a number of vintage Martins from the the late nineteenth century on to um, um, the uh, oh, I still have a couple of guitars from the late 60s early 70s but you know these are traditional instruments and they they're made of wood they're made lovingly by eye uh, martin guitars for instance and part of the reason that many of them were not very well uh, in in tune you know the, they place great value in 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 doing a lot of the work by eye without actually taking really careful measurements and that um that's all very well as long as you get a good one but if you get a bad one then uh, you might be having reason to complain, mm. just as you know a, a beautiful handmade uh, Leica lens you might spend several thousand pounds on today, and unfortunately, it may not turn out to be a good one. Um, the one that's on this camera is going back shortly because it does have some inherent focus problems, and it's a brand new lens, you know, made today. Um, it's kind of irritating, but that that's in a way somehow endearing that there is no perfection, even in perfection. There is always some human frailty can come into play to mar something that is otherwise uh, a beautiful bringing together of technology, technique, artisanship, um, and design. It, it's... Um, it's the world we live in increasingly polarized between technology and the, tradi the traditions of what it is that we we do. Um, photography in the early part of the 20th century depended on technology that was available, but some of those old lenses and indeed old cameras are still beautiful, not works of art, but works of great passion and engineering culture, um, which the Japanese saw fit to copy uh, endlessly. Uh -huh. We are running out of time before my next one, which I've got to do for Iceland. So if you have two quick questions, I will try unusually to give you two quick answers. Uh, okay. Um, I was going to ask you about um, you, the Captain uh, Beefheart's Magic Band supported Tull um, on the US tour many years ago. I'm just wondering if you had any run-ins with uh, Frank Zappa. I never met Frank Zappa, no, but, um, and Don Van Bliet, Captain Beefheart, AKA, um, didn't have uh, anything really great to say about Frank. I think they'd fallen out at that point. And so there was no, uh, I'm sorry, someone will have to pick this up because I'm in an office. No. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think it all, they'd fallen out by that point and there was no, there was no, uh, as far as I know, no real contact between them. Uh, two minutes, two minutes, 
So yeah, I, but uh, they, they they were an interesting bunch, and Frank uh, and uh, Beefheart was a very insecure, um, tyrannical man who used his his uh, power over people to overcome his own innate insecurity. Um, you, you could read him like a book. He didn't want you to read him like a book, but he was very obviously a certain kind of a guy. But nonetheless, a fascinating character in his own way, a major part of the more creative side of American music at that point. And so um, I um, I uh, enjoyed my brief um, moments with, with Don Van Vliet, more so than his band members did, because there grew a huge animosity between them and him. Um, which I think began at, when they were recording Trout Mouse Replica, but by 1974, they, they were, it was a very unhappy crowd. It was unhappy in 1972 when we toured with them, but um, towards the end, and I got to know the Magic Band guys. In fact, I recorded some stuff with them in um, San Francisco or wherever it was at the time, uh, a couple of years later. So yeah, I got all that. I got their side of the, the uh, the tricky equation, right. uh, and finally, before I go off to do my last one, my next interview, rather, John. Uh, just read the biography of John Fogerty. He said that Scotty Moore invented rock and roll guitar. To what extent would you agree with him? Well, I have a I had a friend, sadly deceased, in 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 the Boston area, who became a huge pal of uh, Scotty Moore, um, and. And and um, and Les Paul too before he died. Um, I mean, it's going back quite a few years, but um, it didn't mean a bunch really to me because I was never into rock and roll in the sense of rock and roll, the the Elvis Presley era of rock and roll. I mean, I, I was slightly seduced as a small child. I mean, nine years old or something by Heartbreak Hotel, um, but. I wasn't really a fan of rock and roll. It, it, it was too obviously Americana for me. And although I did learn and enjoy learning from black American folk music, mm -hmm. the blues, uh, it was it was a means to an end. It was a way of learning some elements of music as a performer um, rather than necessarily wanting to try to recreate that music. So I was a fan of blues. I was not a fan of rock and roll, except when there was a little bit of crossover between them, as there was in Heartbreak Hotel. But uh, no, Scotty Moore and all those guys. Um, who was the guy who played, uh, session guy who played with um, Booker T and the MGs? I rather liked him. And I can't remember his name off the top of my head, although I was listening to some stuff the other day. Um, he was a great player, just as um, the guitarist for Johnny Kidd and the Pirates was another of those people who had something special. Yeah. And and the guy who, again, sadly died not too long ago, forgive me, I, I'm not a big music fan, so I don't always remember the names of these folks, but played with the, um, the band from Essex, the guy with, with the jitters, you know, Looked around. Oh, and... um, uh, Doctor Feelgood. Yeah, exactly. And, um, yeah. What's, what's Wilco Johnson? Yeah, Wilco Johnson. I mean, he, he had a bit of magic going on there, and and to people who were big fans of uh, the early days of the Smiths, and I was I was never a Smiths fan, <laughs> or Morrissey fan, <clears throat> until three weeks ago when I decided I should try and try and get to know this uh, this character, and uh, I am now an enormous fan of particularly of Morrissey's later work, and. Um, it just shows, you know, that you, you maybe died in the wall and set in your views about things. But sometimes to examine something that you feel is not your cup of tea is a very profitable exercise. And I, I've now decided Morrissey is a, a man of of great innate skill in terms of economy of melody, his delicate relationship between melody and harmony and the chordal structure of the music but it's um, it's the Apple Mac of that era of pop music. It's a great simplicity, economy of style, a great a great elegance is the way perhaps to describe it. Mm -hmm. So Morrissey gets my my thumbs up, and um, the only reason I started listening to him is because I read some stuff that he'd reportedly said, and um, which was. Again, again, very politically incorrect. Yes. Um, and he did this a few years ago, but apparently his 
tending to repeat things up until recently. I think he's learned his lesson finally that, you know, best to best to uh, step back and uh, don't uh, follow in the footsteps of Roger Waters. Anyway, on on that note, <laughs> which we have yet returned to yet again, yes. um, I will have to say goodbye, and uh, um, I'm off to thanks. I'm off to Reykjavik now. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this uh, interview. The uh, rock flute comes out this Friday. There is a purchasing link below this video. Ian, you have a wonderful day. Well, uh, 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 the best I can hope for is it's as good as yesterday. And t <laughs> tomorrow might be even better. Who knows? So thank you very much. Very nice to talk to you and take care. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.